What's cracking guys, in this video I'll be covering hyperbolic graph convolutional neural networks by the authors from the Yuri Leskovitz group at Stanford. And we're going to see that hyperbolic keyword here in the title is what makes this paper particularly scary and math heavy. And I'm going to also argue that it's not just mathematics for the sake of mathematics. I'm going to show you why they chose, they have chosen to, to use this uh, exotic uh, geometric uh, space uh, and use it to, 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 to learn uh, like useful embeddings later on for node classification and link prediction tasks. So um, let me start with, with abstract here and then I'm going to show you a nice visualization that's going to uh, give you like a gut feeling for why we are doing, why are we are using hyperbolic spaces uh, in the first place. And I'm going to also get into the mathematical formalism. So if you're not familiar with what like curvature of space is, what hyperbolic space is, uh, don't worry. So we'll get there. Okay. So let's start here. Uh, graph convolutional neural networks, or GCNs for short, embed nodes in a graph into Euclidean space, which has been shown to incur a large distortion when embedding real world graphs with scale free or hierarchical structure. Okay. And then they say we derive GCN's operations in the hyperboloid model of hyperbolic space and map Euclidean input features to embeddings in hyperbolic spaces with different trainable curvature at each layer. So my whole goal of this video will be to decode what like the, the thing they just said in this in this particular sentence here. Um, okay, so let me just read this one. And then I'm going to tell you what this scale free uh, graph is. So in particular, scale free graphs have tree like structure and in such graphs, the graph volume defined as the number of nodes with some radius to a center node grows exponentially as a function of, of radius. So basically scale free uh, networks are just a particular uh, type of networks that have this this power law behavior where uh, nodes that have a lot of connections become less and less frequent. As you can see here asymptotically we have k which is the number of, of nodes. Uh, we, ha we have that the probability of a node having k connections as k grows you can see that like basically that, that probability drops uh, according to this power law here. So yeah um, basically the, the, the main idea actually is that this exponential uh, keyword and if we have like uh, graphs that are crowded because of this exponential growth of neighbors that's when we want to use uh, the hyperbolic space so now let me give you uh, like a visual intuition for why that may be okay let's get to this chart here okay so let's imagine we have our nodes and we have the associated node features and we can always uh, basically visualize node features as points in, in like a Euclidean space. So let's now imagine our Euclidean space is this plane here. We have the points here and you can, you can, you can kind of imagine that if we have like exponentially more neighbors here, if, if it's kind of crowded, then mapping to this uh, like ge geometric space, which we called a hyperbolic space uh, is going to uh, make them uh, more spread out and like that, that's the basic intuition basically by spreading the points which are densely um, clustered together in the Euclidean space uh, so by spreading them out in the hyperbolic space you make it easier to discern to discriminate between different uh, node features and th thus do better uh, job at classification etc. So that's the, 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 the main uh, mental model I want you to have uh, throughout this, this video. Um, and having said that, now let me let me dig into uh, like uh, mathematical formalisms and let me try and explain what what the hyperbolic GCNs basically are. Okay, I'm gonna start with uh, some basic notation and explanation of what GCNs are. If you haven't, if you've never watched uh, GraphML videos so far, go ahead and check out my playlist on GraphML. Uh, like in particular, go and watch the GCN, so Graph Convolutional Network. Uh, paper as well as maybe graph attention uh, network uh, paper, so GAT paper. Uh, so that's gonna get you up to speed. But here I'm just gonna briefly uh, recap uh, what we've seen in those videos. So first of all, the, the whole point of graph uh, like representation learning is to learn these uh, useful representations of, of nodes and sometimes edges, which we can then use to do classification tasks on nodes, on graphs, on edges, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So let me just show you the formalism here. So graph representation learning is this mapping F. So from, from this set V of, of nodes, 
uh, set E of edges. And then we have uh, associated node features. Sometimes we also have edge features, but here I'm just gonna, they just ignored uh, the edge features. So you can see the notation is the following. So X of I, which means node I. Uh, so these are the features at z the raw features because uh, basically zero means uh, zeroth layer before we even started applying the, the graph uh, neural network. So, and also we have this symbol E, which means these are Euclidean raw features of this particular node I. So that's how you treat this symbol here, okay. And the goal is to find uh, like a mapping uh, to this uh, basically a representation Z, which is of dimension, uh, the number of nodes times uh, D prime, which is the dimensionality of your output uh, node features. Okay, so th the whole point is to find like a basically uh, good features so, so, so that we can discriminate between different classes or do whatever, uh, arbitrary task. Okay. So that's the graph representation learning. Now, quickly on to how uh, graph convolutional neural networks work. Uh, let me just maybe draw a simple example graph here. So we have a node I here. We have a couple of neighbors. So we have some neighbors here. They are connected to node I. Uh, of course, these neighbors could have their own uh, neighbors, etc., etc. But let's focus on this particular node I here and let's see how do we learn the representation. Uh, of, of that particular node. Okay, so what they first do is they create this uh, intermediate representation H. So I can see here from layer L mi minus one, which is the previous layer, uh, we do the mapping using the, the weight matrix and then we add the bias. So we'll have like a separate set of these W's and B's uh, in every single layer of the graph uh, neural network of the GCN in this particular example. So once we form these intermediate representations, what we do in order to update the, the feature vector of this node i is we simply sum. So we, we sum the, the, this intermediate representation of node i with uh, like a sum over neighbors uh, of weighted intermediate representations. So let me just kind of break that down quickly. Basically what I've said there is the following. So let's imagine we have, so these are the neighbors. We have three neighbors in this particular example. We have certain uh, basically feature vectors associated with the neighbors, so something like that. And let's imagine these are the H's. So these are the, the representations that we have after we do this particular mapping here. So we just do weighted average of those, of those particular feature vectors we sum them up and uh, then apply the nonlinear uh, activation function in order to get uh, basically a novel, so layer L uh, representation of, of node I. So we're gonna finally end up having uh, like H I for layer L. And these are just Euclidean features now, okay. Now these W, um, IJs, depending on, on the architecture, the, the, these could be learnable, but that's now getting into the attention spectrum. Uh, what, what the original GCN uh, did here is basically, so this, this WIJ was simply one over square root DI times DJ, where D is just a degree of a node. So that means you basically normalize uh, this particular presentation uh, depending on the degree of this node and degree of your target node J. So let's say this is node J in this particular example. Okay, so that's, that's, that's how, they, uh, how they've done it in the original paper. And that's the GCN formalism. Now, for the more important part, let me introduce you to that formalism of, of hyperbolic spaces and let's see what it's all about. Okay, so hyperbolic spaces have uh, different models. The most famous ones is this so-called Lorentz model, also known as the hyperboloid model, as you can see here. And there is also this Poincaré uh, ball model of, of hyperbolic space. So here they are gonna work with the hyperboloid model because they showed it's more stable. And so they, they, they basically stuck with it. So we are going to be working with the hyperboloid model of hyperbolic space. So they introduced this uh, like inner product uh, called Minkowski inner product. So it's a simple mapping of, of you map two tuple uh, of, of these uh, d plus one dimensional points into the real, uh, basically uh, into a real number. And this is how Minkowski product is defined. Basically, it's similar to your to a, to a dot product to which you're used to. And the only difference is basically uh, this, this addition of a minus sign for the first coordinate 
of the points uh, in, in this space. Okay, next up, they denote by this HDK, uh, they denote the hyperboloid manifold in D dimensions with constant negative curvature minus one over K, where K is always bigger than zero. So briefly, just what a curvature of space is that m may seem like very scary, but it's not. Uh, basically, um, you're usually used to working uh, in the Euclidean space. So let's imagine we have uh, like a uh, example of a Euclidean space, a 2D space, uh, like a plane here. If we shoot uh, parallel geodesics, where geodesic is just a generalization of uh, like a straight line to arbitrary spaces. So if we were to shoot them in Euclidean space here in a plane, uh, you, you can see that the, the distance between these two lines is always going to be constant and these two lines will never intersect nor diverge. They'll always stay at the same distance from each other. That's not the case in every single space, and that's why we have the notion of curvature. In the case of a sphere, if you shoot two parallel geodesics, you can see they are going to intersect at the North Pole in this particular example, which means when the, when, the, when, the geodesics, when the parallel geodesics intersect, we call that space positively curved. Uh, and on the other hand, if the parallel geodesics diverge, then we call that space uh, negatively curved. And you can see here an example of a hyperbolic space here. So you can imagine if I were to extrapolate these points here, they are going to diverge each in its own direction here across this hyperbolic space. So that's the idea with, with curvature. It's not, not, not that fancy, just once you have this visual mental, like mental picture, then uh, everything becomes uh, much easier. Okay, so next up, they have this uh, tangent space at point X of the manifold H D, uh, D K. And let me just now show you how they define those two formally. So again, uh, this, this hyperboloid uh, model is defined as a set of D plus one dimensional points such that the Minkowski uh, inner product between a point with itself is basically always gonna be constant and equals to minus K. And additionally, the first coordinate of, of, these, uh, of these points needs to be positive. So that's, that's how we define the hyperboloid model. Um, following up, we have this tangent space, which is just like a set of perpendicular vectors. So a set of orthogonal vectors to your uh, vector X. So again, basically it's a set of vectors V, uh, D plus one dimensional vectors V, such that the inner product, again, Minkowski inner product equals zero. So tangent space is a concept you're familiar with, uh, uh, like even though this is just like a, let, let me give you a, like an analogous uh, case. Uh, in the case of, a, of a, like a, sphere let's let's imagine we have a sphere here so we have a sphere here and basically this is like maybe north pole this is like south pole uh tangent space to the north pole would be just a, like a simple plane it's a plane such that it touches the the north pole it basically touches a sphere only at a single point and that's at the North Pole. And you can see here that all of the vectors in this particular plane, so let me draw a couple of vectors here, all of these vectors are going to be perpendicular. So if I take the center of the sphere as, as, the, as, the, as the origin, and if I were to draw, so this is the point X in this formalism, so this is point X. And so basically you can see that this vector here so all of these vectors in the plane are perpendicular, are orth orthogonal to this particular vector x. So this is basically um, a nice way to formula to algebraically um, describe uh, this notion of a tangent space. We'll soon see why it's convenient to, instead of working on the manifold, to be working on, on a particular tangent space of that manifold. We'll see why that is convenient. Okay. Uh, let me continue here and let me introduce a couple more details. So I'm going to quickly scheme over, over these formalisms because they're not as vital for this paper, but let me just introduce you to the mathematics. It may be interesting. So now for V and W, which lie in the tangent space of the hyperboloid model at point X, we define this G of X, um, which is basically uh, something called a Riemannian metric tensor, or it's, a simp it's basically defined as a Minkowski uh, inner product. And is going to later on um, allow us to define distances in the tangent space. That's why it's, a, it's, a, it's an important construct. And we call this tuple of the hyperboloid uh, model and this uh, Riemannian uh, metric tensor, we call this a Riemannian manifold with negative curvature minus one over K. Okay. 
So not as important, just like introducing you to some, to some notation. Uh, so finally, the, the, the tangent space is useful to perform Euclidean operations undefined in hyperbolic space. And we denote uh, by the norm of v, we, we basically induce uh, the norm of a vector in tangent space uh, by doing a square root of the inner, inner product where inner product is Minkowski inner product. And that's how we de define the norm of vectors. And by doing that, we basically uh, have a nice way to uh, define a distance in tangent spaces uh, of, of, of this particular hyperboloid uh, manifold. Okay, so all of that formalism was basically so that we can understand what um, exponential and logarithmic maps are. So this, this is going to be the main construct we need to understand in order to understand how hyperbolic GCNs work. Before I get there, I need to briefly introduce geodesics, uh, which are basically just, a, and they say here, which are generalizations of shortest paths in graphs or straight lines in Euclidean geometry. So that's just a generalization, a notion of, uh, of like a shortest um, path between two points in arbitrary uh, spaces. So let me show you how they define it. Let X be a point on the hyperboloid manifold. Let U be uh, a, like a basically a point in a vector in the tangent space of that point X. Uh, we call that U the unit speed. And because they're going to basically make sure that the inner product here or the norm of that particular vector is gonna be equal to one. Uh, and then they say the unique unit speed geodesic denoted like this, such that uh, basically that geodesic uh, at, at point zero equals to this point X on the manifold. Next up, we have gamma dot, which just basically means a velocity vector at point uh, evaluated at zero is gonna be equal exactly to that U, unit speed. Okay, so let me give you uh, like a mental model I have when I think about these geodesics. So imagine we have a curved space such as this one. So something like this. And that's just like a, basically imagine we had some type of a, like a sheet of paper or something and I'm looking at that sheet from this side and that's why we get something like this. So now, now imagine we have point X, which is the point uh, we've been using in this formalism of the geodesics here. And let's imagine we have like a unit vector, uh, uh, unit speed vector u. Uh, and now what geodesic is, is, and, and that this u lies in the tangential plane of this point x. So imagine we have like a tangential plane here and u just lies in that plane. And so what a geodesic is, is imagine we, we start from this point and we have this velocity vector. And for some amount of time, you basically shoot like a point from you, sh you shoot a point from x uh, using this velocity vector v and you just trace out where that point will go on this on this curved space so basically imagine if we were to travel for one second maybe we'd end up somewhere here and we'll see why that is useful because that basically allows us to map uh, vectors from tangent space, as you can see here. So we, we basically just mapped this vector here. We mapped it onto a particular point on the on the manifold here. And that's how I like to think about geodesics and um, exponential and logarithmic maps, which I'm gonna introduce in a second. So, and now we have, uh, for this particular hyperboloid model, we can see how the geodesic is defined here. Basically some complex uh, equation uh, using hyperbolic cosine and the hyperbolic sine. Uh, and it's not even important, you can treat this as a black box. So what is important for you to understand is that as we are, as we are basically changing this parameter t, we're going to be tracing a path along the manifold. So we're going to be tracing a point that's always going to belong to manifold and not to the tangent space. And here they show how you can calculate the distance between two points on this hyperboloid manifold. Again, some complicated equation. We have Minkowski inner product, we have um, arc, cosine, hyperbolic. So not that important. You can treat it as a black box. So what is important is that we have um, like geodesic and we have a distance. Okay, so now to the more important part and that's the exponential and logarithmic maps. Let's see how these are defined. So given a point on the manifold X and a tangent vector V uh, that belongs to the tangent space uh, as defined by point X. So the exponential map uh, maps from the tangent space of X onto the manifold, onto the hyperboloid manifold. And you can see how it assigns the point. It's basically evaluated as, as geodesic at 
when you set t equals to one. And that's precisely what I just explained here. So you have uh, basically, let, let me just map this directly here. So here in this notation, we have x and v, which means this thing here, we now call it, so instead of u, we call it v. So this is v, this is x. And we, we basically, what we do is, um, we trace out this geodesic. So gamma is a unique geodesic satisfying that at, at t equals zero, it equals x and the velocity is described by, by vector v, which means, as I said, so we have a point here at x with the velocity v and we just trace out its path along the manifold and that's how we map vector v to a novel point on the manifold. So that's, that's your exponential, um, basically exponential map. Uh, vice versa, we can define a logarithmic map which has this property that if you then apply, after applying exponential, if you apply a log, then you'll, you'll, you'll end up with the initial vector v. Uh, and th then they say here, in general, Riemannian manifolds, these operations are only defined locally, but in the hyperbolic space, they form a bijection between the hyperbolic space and the tangent space at a point. Now, this might, might not be um, apparent why this is relevant, but like it is. Uh, I'm gonna briefly tell you what this means. And that's the following. So for this particular hyperbolic model, you can see it here, uh, this tangent space, even if it was infinite, we'd have a unique point. So for every single point on this plane, so we basically have a situation where we can map any arbitrary point here to some point, unique point on this particular hyperboloid uh, manifold. And that would not be the case for arbitrary general Riemannian man manifold. So let me, for example, sh show you a contra uh, example. So let, let's imagine we have a sphere. So let's imagine we have a sphere here. And let's imagine that at the North Pole, we have a, like a tangent space and let's imagine it's just an infinite tangent space. And so you can imagine that if we had a vector such as this one, okay, so this vector would maybe, uh, if we were to trace out the geodesic here by doing um, exponential, uh, by applying the exponential map, we'd end up maybe mapping this, this vector to this point here, okay? But now the thing is, because of how this manifold looks like, it's a sphere, if we had like a maybe like 3x the size of this vector, we'd end up doing like doing a full circle and then one more half and we'd end up at the same point here, which means we've basically mapped, we don't have a projection anymore. We mapped these two vectors from the plane onto the same point. So both of these map to the same point and we don't have a bijection and that, that's, that's a problematic property if you wanna learn embeddings, okay. So that's, that's everything you need to understand. Um, now they just show how these uh, exponential and logarithmic maps look like for this particular example of using a hyperbolic manifold. You can just see they're using cosine, hyperbolic cosines, et cetera, et cetera. But the main idea is the thing I just explained to you. Okay, now that we have uh, this uh, differential geometry under our belt, let's now dig into the actual model and understand how it works. Okay, so this should now be fairly straightforward. The first step we need to do is given our node feature vectors, which are in the Euclidean space initially, we first want to map them into hyperbolic space, okay? So how we do that is the following. So they define something called North Pole of this hyperboloid model, uh, and they define it like this. You can see this uh, like bold O, uh, the first coordinate is the square root of k, everything else is zero, and this is the north pole of the, of the hyperboloid. And so why that is important is because if we were to construct a point, if we were to augment our uh, Euclidean feature vector here by just prepending zero uh, as the zeroth dimension, we can see that if we were to do inner product between this augmented uh, Euclidean point with the uh, origin, we'd get a zero because basically we have zero here, which means zero times zero is gonna be zero. And because here we have all zeros, no matter what we have in X, we're gonna end up with zeros. Once you sum that up, a bunch of zeros uh, yields a zero. And so that's why we have this fact here. Uh, interesting property, if you understand what this, what's the semantics behind this expression, that's that we, we now know that this, is a that, that this uh, augmented uh, point lies in the tangent space of this, of this particular uh, north pole of the hyperboloid, okay? 
So that's why we have, when we have zero, that means we have orthogonal uh, like vectors. And they say, therefore, we interpret this point here as a point in the tangent space of the North Pole. And uh, basically, then they show how, how you can map uh, from from the from that augmented point in the tangent space by just applying exponential map uh, at North Pole to get the finally to, to get the hyperboloic uh, embeddings. Okay, let me quickly show you how you should think about this as it's fairly easy given the diagram up here. So this is the tangent space of the North Pole. Imagine that this red dot here is the North Pole. So this is the tangent space of the North Pole of this hyperboloid model here. Okay, so now we want to map an arbitrary uh, point uh, from the tangent space onto the hyperbolo uh, hyperboloid space. So what we're going to do is the following. So imagine this is the point we're trying to, to map. So this is the one we're trying to find um, like a corresponding point on the manifold for this particular point here in the Euclidean space. So what we do is we, you can see we have this vector here. And imagine this, this plane is now touching this hyperboloid model at a single point. So it's a tangent space, as I said. And then we just do the exponential map, which is we shoot a point, we start here from the North Pole, and we just shoot a point in that direction with that velocity vector, and then it's gonna trace out this particular geodesic, and we're gonna end up with this point here. And that's why this point maps to this one. It's fairly easy, really, once you understand the, the, the visualization of this, uh, it should be fairly trivial, okay. So that's the first step uh, of the uh, hyperbolic GCN model. We map from Euclidean points into uh, hyperboloid points. Okay, the next step is we need to now do, um, we need to find equivalent operations in the hyperboloic space to what GCN is doing in Euclidean space. So that means we first need to understand how to do feature transforms in the hyper hyperbolic space. Let's see what they say. So we now want to learn transformations of points on the hyperboloid manifold. However, there is no notion of vector space structure in hyperbolic space. Uh, so I think the main thing here you should you should have in your mind is like the, the closure property is 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 violated. What I mean by that is if you are on a plane and you were to add two arbitrary vectors, you end up being in the plane still. So that's the closure property. So basically. Uh, let me go up here again. So if you have uh, two vectors here, let's imagine we have vec this vector here and this vector here. If we add them up, we'll end up with additional vector that lies in the plane. But if we were to do, if we were to do the same thing for this uh, hyperboloid model, we'd basically be um, uh, violating the closure property, and that's why we don't have a notion of, of vector space on this on this hyperbolic space. That, that's, that's, that's how I understand it. I may be wrong here, but like that's my best understanding of, of this thing. Okay, so um, let's continue here. So the main idea is to leverage the exponential and log maps uh, so that we can use the tangent space to perform Euclidean transformations. So let me break it down for you. What they now do is they're gonna use the log operator to now get from, from the hyperboloic point onto the tangent space, again, of the North Pole. So we are always mapping onto the tangent space of the North Pole. Then we apply, once we have a point there, then we apply this, this, this linear mapping uh, W, uh, which, may be, uh, which may reduce or increase the dimension, so that's why we have D prime here. Finally, we apply, again, exponential mapping, which means we take this, whatever this point here is, and we form a vector between origin and this point here, and we do the usual, like the, the, the shooting metaphor, and that's how we end up on the manifold again. So again, we, we get from the, we, we map from manifold onto the tangent space, we do the transform there, the linear transform, and then we map it back onto the manifold, okay? I'm gonna stop explaining uh, now the exponential and log maps and assume you understand how we map from manifold to tangent space and back. Uh, okay, now we have we need to add the concept of a bias and how we do that is the following so bias is a vector uh, That's so we def they define B so the bias as an Euclidean vector located in the tangent space of the North Pole again of the hyperboloid model and So what they do is they do uh, something called uh, basically parallel transport 
and the parallel transport is going to take the bias vector that lies in the tangent space of the North Pole. It's going to transport it in a smart way and I will not get into the formalism of parallel transport. But you can imagine just kind of shifting that bias vector from the tangent space of the North Pole into the tangent space of this point uh, X. Uh, the point of interest, the point we're currently trying to transform. And then we're just going to apply exponential map uh, starting from that point X. Now this may be confusing, but again, it has a very like simple and uh, simple visual interpretation and, uh, and semantics. Uh, it's just hard to, to, to maybe understand it from the first uh, attempt from this uh, equation. So let me try and get back to our diagram here. Um, so imagine we have, let, let me just delete a couple of things here so, so as to reduce the clutter. So let, let me delete all of this. And let's now try and understand how the biasing works. Okay, so let's imagine we have, um, so this is the, 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 the tangent space of the North Pole. And let's imagine we have a bias vector somewhere here. So maybe it's something like this. And it's a learnable vector, remember that. So we are trying to learn weights and biases. Uh, so what we do is the following. So now Im imagine we have uh, a point that we are trying to transform and I'm going to pick just a, just a si single one, like let's take this one. And basically that point is mapped onto this point on the manifold. And you can now imagine that this point here, we have an associated tangent space. I'm gonna try and do that. It's gonna probably fail miserably. So we have a tangent space that touches only this point. Uh, so it's a tangent space of this particular point. Okay, so what we're going to do is take this bias vector B and we're gonna transport it onto this ta tangent space of this point here. Okay, so we're gonna transport it to here. Let's imagine maybe it's now going to lie maybe somewhere here. And once we have that, we just apply the exponential map, which means we're going to shift, uh, which means we're gonna do the following. We're gonna take this point and now because of the bias vector and applying the exponential map, we're gonna end up here. So we, add, we, we just successfully added a bias uh, in the hyperbolic space. So that's what we've done. Okay, let me try and explain this uh, once more because it's hard to visualize this and I did not do a great job of drawing this. So we have a bias vector here in the tangent space. We map it, we parallel transport it into this different tangent space that corresponds to this particular point of interest. And once we have the bias vector there, then we do the shooting. So that's, that's the exponential map. And we end up from this orange point, we end up here. And thus we, as I said, successfully managed to add a bias in the hyperbolic space. Okay, that's the best I can do um, in, 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 in one attempt. Okay, so let's get back to the um, section 4.2. We've defined, we've su successfully defined a linear mapping in the tangent space and we've successfully defined uh, bias as well. Uh, next up, we need to define neighborhood aggregation. So uh, I'm gonna just jump to the equations straight ahead. So here is what they do. Uh, given two nodes, um, xi and xj, we're gonna apply uh, log mapping, uh, and that means we end up in the tangent space of the North Pole, and once we are there, uh, we're going to concatenate them, as you can see by the symbol here, and then we just pass them into the MLP, and we do that for all of the J's from the neighborhood of node I, and then we just apply softmax. That's how we basically end up with W uh, I J's. Once we have those coefficients, we use those coefficients to do the aggregation the following way. So again, we have, uh, these are the hyperbolic embedding vectors of neighbors uh, x, j's. Uh, we're going to do logarithmic map, but this time the map starts, the map is based uh, in uh, point x, i, and not the North Pole. We're gonna see why that is. And once we have that, that means now we're in the tangent space. Now we can do the um, simple uh, scaling with Wij's. We sum those up and finally we end up with some resultant vector in the tangent space and then we map it, map it back using the exponential map. And that's how we end up with the new representation for this particular vector uh, x, i. So because this was the first time we did not use the North Pole as the basis of mapping. Uh, let me just kind of uh, explain this part a bit better. So note that our proposed aggregation is directly performed in the tangent space of each center point X, I, uh, H. 
uh, as this is where the Euclidean approximation is best. We show in our ablation experiments that this local aggregation outperforms aggregation in tangent space at the origin due to the fact that relative distances have lower distortion in our approach. Basically what this means is, let me go back to the example I showed you before. Um, so let's again focus on this particular orange point and its tangent space. So now we're gonna map uh, all of the points on the manifold onto this particular tangent space and then do the uh, basically aggregation in that tangent space instead of using the tangent space of the origin. Uh, that's the difference and they, as, it, as they said, uh, they've done ablations and it turns out that doing this is better than doing aggregation in the in the uh, in this particular tangent space here. Okay, so that's it. Um, let me go back here and let me uh, end up uh, explaining the nonlinear activations. So here is how is how the nonlinearity is defined uh, on a curved space. So we take the particular embedding vector of interest that lies on the hyperboloid model. We do the log mapping, which means we map it onto the tangent space of the North Pole. Then we apply the nonlinearity, whatever that is, like ReLU usually, and then we apply the X map, returning it back onto the manifold. Uh, the thing to notice here is that these curvatures, so KL minus one and KL, these curvatures might be different and they are actually a learnable parameter in uh, hyperbolic uh, GCNN GCN model. So they can do this because uh, the mathematics adds up. They say here, fortunately, uh, ten tangent spaces of the North Pole are shared across hyperboloid model manifolds of the same dimension that have different curvatures, making equation 10, so this is this equation, uh, mathematically correct. Okay, that's pretty much it. Now let's glue everything back together and try to get a holistic overview of what's going on here. I know this was a lot of mathematics, differential geometry, a lot of details. Let's try and get like a high level mental model of what just happened here. Uh, okay, so there's a couple of steps. Okay, so first step is we map from the Euclidean space onto the hyperbolic space. Uh, once we have the feature vectors in the hyperbolic space, then we do these uh, basically uh, special types of uh, feature transforms and bias. So there is a lot of back and forth between manifold and tangent space. We mostly do, we do everything in tangent space. So we map this feature from hyperbolic space into tangent space. We apply the linear transformation. We get, we return it, we map it back onto the manifold and then we just shift it using this particular bias vector. Uh, and it still remains on the manifold. So that's this first step. Once we have those features, we do that for, for all of the node features of our graph. Once we have that, we do the smart aggregation, whereby again, we're going to be mapping onto tangent spaces of, of those, uh, and, and this time tangent space is defined by, by particular node i for which we're trying to find the representation, okay? We're not using the North Pole tangent space this time. We do the uh, weighted sum in that tangent space and then we map the, res we map the result resultant point back onto the manifold. That's how we get these y's. And then finally we apply this nonlinear um, uh, basically mapping, uh, again we have uh, back and forth between tangent space and manifold and we just apply we kind of squeeze in the the, the your your regular nonlinearity between these mappings okay that's that's it um it looks complicated uh it actually is not that complicated when you're familiar with differential geometry and uh, and this kind of sinks in uh and yeah okay so let me now briefly walk you through um the results, they showed that for a particular class of graphs that have uh, this low hyperbolicity value, delta, which basically means it's a fancy way of saying these are graphs that are tree-like in nature. And they showed that uh, basically HGCN, so that's the, this model in this, introducing this paper, outperforms all of the previous baselines. So even GNN such as GCN and GET and SAGE and SGC, and as well as uh, neural networks and some shallow embeddings. So they show better results there and they show that as we go to higher uh, hyperbolicity constant, uh, which means uh, the, the, the graphs are less and less uh, exponential in nature and less tree-like, they, they show worse results here. Okay, and final results I wanna show you. Uh, 
are here. They've done some ablations. Basically, um, the ablations they've done is doing this attention aggregation uh, in the North Pole's tangent space instead of using uh, XIs uh, to form the tangent space. So that's the difference. And here C just stands for whether they use trainable curvatures or not. And they showed that by, by, by uh, both using the trainable curvatures as well as using the uh, aggregation in the tangent space of uh, XIs, that gives them the best results across various different data sets. So yeah, just some ablations they've done. Um, additionally, they showed that uh, for, some, for this particular data set disease, the higher the curvature of the hyperboloid model, uh, basically the better the results. Uh, let me just show you how to parse this, this, this chart. Basically, uh, if K is large, let's say 10 to the power of three, so that's like 1,000. If you plug in 10 to the power of three, you'll end up with minus three. So that means we are here. And you can see that for big K, for like 1,000, we have like lower uh, metric here compared to if K was much smaller. So if K is maybe, um, maybe one over 10, uh, that would be 10 raised to the power of minus one, which means we map to here. So that means for one over 10, for, for, for um, high curvature, uh, basically we have better performance. And again, this ties back nicely to the visualization, to the explanation I started with. Uh, basically, if we have um, crowded points in the Euclidean space, the more, the, the, so, so, so the higher the curvature of this particular hyper, hyperboloid model, and I'm having such a hard time pronouncing that word. Uh, so let me just draw it like this. So if this was even more curved, so something like this, that means that basically the separation would be even bigger because you can imagine that a, even a small perturbation here in the, in the Euclidean space would cause those two points to be mapped onto uh, very like distant points on the actual manifold. So maybe this one here would be mapped here and this one here would be mapped even here. So, and the higher the curvature, the bigger this distance will grow. And so that's why you can kind of imagine that um, higher curvatures uh, like in the negative direction um, basically help, help us spread out the feature vectors. Okay. Um, that was my best attempt to explain this paper. Uh, there is a lot of mathematics. Um, I'm not uh, an expert in differential geometry. I know uh, enough to, to basically understand on an intuitive level how this works. Uh, it's hard to visualize all of this. I hope that this paper helped you uh, understand um, basically this, this, uh, this, this model a bit better. If it did, uh, consider sharing the video out. Uh, also consider subscribing to this channel. And finally, join our Discord community. Until next time, bye-bye.